there is something mesmerizing about rotations in four or more dimensions. With more dimensions, you unlock more possibilities for your rotations that I at least find beautiful. But I want to convince you that looking in a higher number of dimensions isn't as mysterious as it might first sound, and we can visualize at least projections of higher dimensional objects even if we can't visualize them entirely authentically. Here's one perspective. Let's start at the bottom with a zero dimensional object, just a point. If I copy that point and then connect them, I form a one dimensional line. If I then copy that line and connect the vertices again, I form a square, a two dimensional object, and I keep going. If I copy the square, connect the vertices, now I formed a cube, a three dimensional object. Now I want to keep going to show a projection in the fourth dimension, but how should I make a copy of the cube? Well, what I'll do is make a larger copy of the cube. And so the size is a proxy for moving into the fourth dimension. And I'm going to connect all the vertices. Now we have a four dimensional object called the Tesseract. So this bubble shape here is a projection of the four dimensional object onto three dimensions, which is then captured by my two dimensional camera sensor. Projections onto your 2D screen do distort angles. This was true even for the cube where all the angles are true 90 degrees in three dimensions, but they are distorted when placed in two dimensions and our minds just totally accept this visualization. But for the Tesseract, it's the same idea. These angles are truly all 90 degrees in four dimensions. They're just distorted by the projection from four dimensions down onto two dimensions. This construction of the Tesseract made the second cube larger than the first in order to display it. And I use something called a stereographic projection in that case, but that's not the only choice. This projection in contrast is called an orthographic projection. And here I've taken a cube and I've now drawn the second cube sort of off and to the side of the first cube before connecting all the lines. In much the same way that a cube is made up of six faces, which are squares, that is down one dimension, the Tesseract is made up of eight different three-dimensional cubes. And I can keep going. Start with the Tesseract, double that, connect the vertices. This is called the Pentaract, or a five-dimensional hypercube, where I say hyper whenever I want to sound cool and talk about something with more than three dimensions. I can keep going to the six cube, the seven cube, all the way up to the ten-dimensional cube. Now, these look so pretty and symmetric in part because I'm choosing very carefully a camera angle to look at these cubes at. Like, for example, just for the normal cube, if I rotate my perspective so I'm looking perfectly at the corner, notice how it sort of collapses into looking like a hexagon. So that's what I've done for these higher dimensional cubes if I want to have a really pretty symmetry to it. Now, what I would really like to explain in this video is the craziness of rotations of these higher dimensional cubes. But before we get there, you might have noticed that this is my first faceless video entirely animated in Python. So I wanted to take just a minute to thank the sponsor of today's video, which is Brilliant.org, because a year ago, I didn't know any Python. So I started Brilliant's programming in Python course, and I found it really effective. It started with the basics, which I needed, but pretty quickly leveled me up into increasingly advanced topics. And because it's very interactive, it built that familiarity and fluency with the basics while leveling up my skills. And doing this just a little bit every day for a couple weeks, I managed to build up from making videos with PowerPoint, if you can believe it, which is how I used to do it, all the way to making well these higher dimensional rotations that have to be programmed entirely in Python. And I've been recommending all of Brilliant's math lessons for years now on this channel. So it was really fun to see firsthand how effective it was for me in what something that was new to me programming. To try everything that Brilliant has for free, go to brilliant.org slash Bazit or click the link in the description and you can use that link to get 20% off an annual premium subscription which gives unlimited daily access to everything on Brilliant. All right, back to the video. What even is a higher dimensional cube? Like, here's a square. A square just consists of all points x and y, in, in this case, where x is between minus 1 and 1 and the same for y. Same for 3D. It's just a list of three numbers x, y, z, where each coordinate is between minus 1 and 1. So a four-dimensional cube isn't mysterious. It's just a list of four numbers now, x, y, z, and w for the fourth dimension. And each number has to be between minus one and one. Kind of boring, to be honest. But now let's go back to rotation because that's where I think things get interesting and where things in the fourth dimension are a little bit different. Because back in three dimensions, there's three sort of nice rotations, which is rotation around coordinate axes, like this is a rotation in the xy plane, this is a rotation in the xz plane, and this is a rotation in the yz plane. 
but there's a limitation because I can't do two of those rotations at the same time. Like, if I tried to rotate both in the XZ plane and in the YZ plane at the same time, they combine to be this rotation where the axis of rotation is tilted off the axes. Because both rotations involve the Z axis, they all get tangled up in each other and result in a net effect of rotation along a weird tilted axis. And in three dimensions, you can only rotate along one axis at a time. For the Tesseract, I can similarly do a rotation in the XY plane, which looks basically the same as rotating the 3D cube did. But I can also do a rotation in the ZW plane, and that looks like this. Remember how in this projection we drew the second cube bigger? Well, the size is sort of a proxy for the fourth dimension. So in this rotation in the ZW plane, you can see points rotating through being on the larger square and on the smaller square. What really sets the fourth dimension apart is that I can do both at the same time. This is me rotating in the XY plane slowly and rotating in the ZW plane relatively quickly. In four dimensions, I can do two different rotations at the same time. And because the XY and ZW planes don't have anything in common but for the origin, I can do these two rotations in these two planes simultaneously without each affecting the other. But to see how I'm actually programming this, we have to add a little bit more formality. Here I am in two dimensions where I only have one option for what rotations look like. I can rotate more or less, but there's just the one axis of rotation which is coming right out of your screen. Notice that rotations preserve the length of vectors, the angle between two vectors, and also the relative ordering of the two vectors. Notice that if I start at one zero on the x-axis, I rotate by an amount theta. We typically call the x and y coordinates cosine of theta and sine of theta. These are the definitions of the trig functions. And similarly, if I had started at zero one up on the y-axis, I rotated by an amount theta, well, that would get me to the point minus sine of theta, cosine of theta. We can take those four numbers, cos of theta, sine of theta, minus sine of theta, and cosine of theta, and abstract them into something called a matrix. And if you've seen matrix multiplication before, you'll recognize this as the two-dimensional rotation matrix, where if you start at any value of x and y, it will tell you where the point ends up after rotation. Now, here is a three-dimensional rotation matrix that does the same rotation in the xy plane we just saw, but it leaves the z coordinate fixed or this one in the yz plane leaves the x coordinate fix. And a standard linear algebra topic is to show that if you multiply rotation matrices, like these ones, then you're going to get another rotation matrix. Just, it might have a messier axis than a nice coordinate axis like I started with. So back to four dimensions, the rotation in the xy plane that we saw earlier is given by this matrix, where it does the cosine and sine trick in the first two dimensions, but it leaves the other two dimensions fixed. The weirder to visualize rotation in the ZW plane is now given by this matrix where it's now the X and Y that are fixed. So the two rotations don't affect each other. And I can put them together to make this matrix which rotates by theta in the XY plane and by phi in the ZW plane. And we are animating both rotations happening at the same time with these two different axes of rotation. And this pattern keeps happening in a higher number of dimensions. For five dimensions, there are five coordinates, and since a rotation takes two of them at a time, you can have at most two independent rotations going on. But jump to six dimensions, and now you can have three independent rotations happening at the same time, where each rotation is transforming one of the planes that takes up two of the six dimensions. And in general, for even dimensions, like two n dimensions, you can rotate in n different directions independently, but in two n plus one dimensions, so an odd number, you still only get the n different dimensions independently because you need two more dimensions to get a new plane of rotation, not just one. Don't forget to check out Brilliant for free at brilliant.org slash Trevor Bazin and to get your 20% off the annual premium subscription. And if you have questions, leave them down in the comments below and we'll do some more math in the next video.